Over 3,000 generals fought for the Germans during the Second World War. Over a thousand American generals also served, as did a similar number of Japanese, British and Soviet generals. A few of these several thousand men well and truly left their mark on history. These were the men who prosecuted devastating attacks and led inspiring defenses, but not all of their names were remembered. In this video, we shed light on five of the best, if not quite as well known, generals of the Second World War. In early 1941, Soviet High Command had so few experienced commanders that they released an officer imprisoned for treason. By 1945, this officer was a marshal of the Soviet Union and he personally led the victory parade in Moscow. His name was Konstantin Rokossovsky. Rokossovsky began his career similarly to Zhukov in that he served with distinction in the Great War, then in the Civil War on the Bolshevik side. He later became fascinated by Marshal Tukhachevsky's visionary ideas on mechanized warfare. But when the Marshal was purged in the Great Terror, Rokossovsky's fascination got him imprisoned. After the disastrous Winter War of 1941, Rokossovsky was reinstated to fill the need for experienced commanders. He excelled, and his 16th Army bore the brunt of the fighting in the defense of Moscow during Operation Typhoon. Stalin was impressed and gave Rokossovsky command of the Don Front at Stalingrad. The Don Front helped to encircle the Germans inside the city and was responsible for crushing 22 divisions during Operation Ring. Rokossovsky went on to command the Central Front in the Battle of Kursk where he defeated the Germans again. His forces pushed on and the general played a key role in Operation Bagration. The Germans soon began to fear Rokossovsky, nicknaming him General Dagger. Opposing Rokossovsky were several German generals, and one of the best was Walter Mödel. Mödel had humbler beginnings than most of the German high command. He wasn't an aristocrat, nor did he have Prussian lineage. He was simply very good at his job. Mödel commanded units during the invasions of Poland, France, and the Soviet Union and these campaigns earned him a reputation as a hard-hitting field commander. His loyalty to the Nazi party propelled him further, and by 1942, he commanded the battle-hardened 9th Army on the Eastern Front. A master of defensive warfare, Mödel became Hitler's fireman. When others believed the position was lost, the fireman swooped in to save it. In the Battle of Kursk, for instance, he salvaged the collapsing German position after Rokossovsky's victory. Mödel became a field marshal in 1944 and fought the Allies in France after the Normandy landings. He was a skilled commander, but the might of the Allied war machine proved too much. After the failure of his offensive in the Battle of the Bulge, Mödel was surrounded. He ordered his troops to disband and committed suicide. Before Erwin Rommel was lionized as the Desert Fox, the title belonged to a British commander. This general was every bit Rommel's equal, scoring victory after victory in the Desert War. His name was Richard O'Connor. O'Connor took command of the Western Desert Force in June 1940. It was based in Egypt, a British protectorate, and comprised roughly 35,000 men and 65 tanks. In September, Mussolini's best general, Graziani, attacked Egypt with 150,000 soldiers and 600 armored vehicles. He believed victory was assured, but O'Connor proved him wrong. O'Connor allowed the Italians to exhaust themselves with their initial thrust, then hit them on their northern flank. As part of Operation Compass, the Western Desert Force smashed through the Italian line and knocked out strong point after strong point via encirclement and isolation. By mid-December, the Italians had been forced from Egypt, having lost 38,000 of their men as POWs. O'Connor then pushed into Libya, routing and destroying the Italians as he went. With every victory, his 36,000 strong force became more comparable to Graziani's. The overall commander, General Wavell, thought O'Connor was doing so well that he replaced his most experienced division, 
the fourth Indian with an inexperienced one, the sixth Australian. But it didn't matter. O'Connor's Australian troops surrounded Tobruk and captured it on January 22nd, 1941, alongside another 27,000 POWs. The Italians retreated, but O'Connor gave them no respite. His armor drove south and outflanked them while his infantry engaged them near the coast. Within a fortnight, the main Italian base at Benghazi fell, with just 36,000 men, many of whom were inexperienced and ill-prepared for desert warfare, O'Connor destroyed an Italian army numbering 10 divisions and took 133,000 prisoners. One British politician commented, Never has so much been surrendered by so many to so few. When Singapore fell, Winston Churchill described it as the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. But for the Japanese, it was a tremendous victory. A victory that belonged to Tomoyuki Yamashita. Yamashita served in a number of military and diplomatic positions in the years preceding the Second World War. One of these was in Germany, where he saw firsthand the devastation Blitzkrieg tactics could inflict. Inspired, he returned to Japan and tried to implement new ideas and reorganize the Imperial Japanese Army. He was one of Japan's strongest proponents of mechanized warfare and wished to end the long-running war in China. But politics got in his way. His ideas were seen as a threat by the heavily factional Japanese military establishment. On November 6, 1941, Yamashita was put in command of the 25th Army. This 30,000 strong force had high morale but was equipped with obsolete weapons. It had only one advantage, a large number of planes and skilled pilots. Yamashita knew that a drawn out battle in Malaya would place him at a disadvantage, so speed was the key. He launched his attack from bases in French Indochina. After rapidly overcoming Commonwealth garrisons, he mounted his troops on bicycles and used their speed to outflank the enemy. Commonwealth commanders were consistently surprised by his resourcefulness as Yamashita often directed his own men down jungle tracks they believed was impassable. When he reached Singapore, he bluffed the British commander, General Percival, into preparing for an attack on the wrong side of the island. Yamashita's men were exhausted and their supply lines were stretched to breaking point, but a rapid assault won him the battle. 80,000 Commonwealth soldiers surrendered to just 30,000 Japanese, earning Yamashita the moniker, the Tiger of Malaya. But not all great generals began their careers before the war. Some had a generalship thrust upon them. This happened to one American officer in the Philippines, the guerrilla commander Wendell Fertig. Fertig wasn't your average general, he was an engineer. After traveling to the Philippines in 1941, Fertig had joined the US Army Reserve as part of his military classes at college. He was on leave in Manila when the war broke out and he was sent to Mindanao to take over engineering activities there. When he arrived, the garrison surrendered to the invading Japanese, but Fertig, refusing to give in, fled into the jungle. Army Reserve Colonel Fertig promoted himself to Brigadier General after making contact with the Filipino guerrilla band. He believed a high-ranking officer would hold more sway over the disparate bands than a mere colonel, and he was right. Fertig was soon running the show. Using his engineering skills, he brewed high-strength palm wine for use as fuel, built a jungle telegraph with soda bottles and fencing wire, made 30 cal cartridges from curtain rods, disassembled Japanese sea mines for gunpowder, made rifle springs from vehicle suspension, and put together a radio from scrap. He brought the same resourcefulness to military operations, ordering attacks on Japanese units and critical infrastructure. Fertig defeated the Japanese using his so-called pillow effect. When a large Japanese unit swept through an area, the guerrilla units dissolved without resisting. The Japanese battalion would break into companies, then platoons, then sections, then squads to search for the rebels. Meanwhile, the guerrillas reformed into company-sized units and then met isolated Japanese squads with superior numbers, guaranteeing them victory. Fertig eventually commanded 32,000 guerrillas, technically making him a lieutenant general, and played a key role in the liberation of the Philippines. Those were five of the Second World War's lesser known yet greatest generals. But what do you think? Could you fight for a regime after you were tortured like Rokossovsky? 
How different do you think the war might have gone if Modal had higher command from the start? Do you think you could be as resourceful as Fertig? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.